Uh, yes, good uh, late morning, I suppose. And uh, as some of you noticed, uh, the students filtering in. Uh, so uh, actually, this is more Scott Walbridge's presentation than mine, but I'm go so I'm going to do Scott Walbridge, and he's going to kick off the, the presentation and tell you about the program. Uh, and I'm hoping uh, that the students came in uh, late enough to hear that last panel presentations and the harsh realities of the building world, uh, regulatory and business uh, stuff, which is part of the purpose of having these symposiums is to get to understand where technology and design fits into this stuff. So Scott Walbridge, a colleague of mine at the, in the Civil and Environmental Engineering uh, Department, uh, he uh, finished his PhD in, in Switzerland in 2005, uh, active member of CSA, American Society of Civil Engineering, uh, specialist in steel structures, bridges, but also dabbles in concrete, aluminum, and weird stuff, as I like to describe it, uh, to, to keep the, the options open about how we're going to hold stuff up. And so I'm going to let Scott uh, take away uh, and start pushing buttons to make stuff happen. Uh, thanks for the introduction, John. And uh, uh, yeah, John and I are going to do this talk together, but I'll do the first part and, and uh, get him to come up here and talk a little more in a few minutes. Um, very. Uh, excited and proud uh, to uh, be here today to talk about our new architectural engineering program at uh, the University of Waterloo. A um, lot of great ideas uh, kicked around this morning about uh, low carbon uh, building design uh, and I, I, I've uh, uh, listened with enthusiasm and interest in everything that's going on. I think one thing we can all agree is that in order to make these ideas uh, durable and, and widespread over the long term we need uh, a supply of young engineers uh, uh, trained in the uh, multidisciplinary uh, field of, of building design uh, to, to come in and help you implement them. And, and so uh, I think this uh, new program is, is going to be a source for those, those uh, young engineers. And so we're very excited uh, to be able to talk about it. So uh, I know I'm sort of between you and, and lunch, or almost, so I'll, we'll, we'll try not to, to drag this out too much, but I think there, there, um, we do have uh, some, some different uh, sort of things we want to talk about. The, the team that developed the program, I want to describe the program a bit so you know the, a bit about what it's about. Um, some novel things we're doing with Studio in the, the, uh, the pedagogy. And then uh, um, John's going to come and talk about um, basically how things have been going so far uh, now that we actually have students here and, and uh, they're a couple of months into their studies. They've done an, an event called Design Days. Uh, they're working on their first studio course, AE100. Uh, and we also have some stuff uh, going on with the low carbon building skills uh, uh, project to develop new tools for uh, these students that they'll have access to in future years. And we'll end by talking about what comes next and how you and industry might uh, uh, be able to help us out or get involved. So uh, this uh, slide just uh, shows a list of the uh, co-authors of the proposal uh, that was written to, to create the program. Um, and so it was a multidisciplinary group uh, from Civil Engineering, uh, School of Architecture, uh, Mechanical and, and Mechatronics Engineering. Uh, here you can see uh, three of the group members trying to answer the question, how many uh, professors does it take to build a flying buttress? Um, turns out the answer is three. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess I just want to add here that this is by no means an exhaustive list of the people who were involved in getting the program off the ground. Uh, the program was first talked about back in 2005. I think I did the math back in September and figured out that our students, uh, current students were just starting kindergarten uh, when we first had the idea to start an RKE program. Um, and uh, there's been many uh, deans, associate deans, provosts, chairs, uh, and other administrators involved in, along the way to get the program approved and, and started. Uh, now that we have an RKE program, uh, it has a, an academic steering committee uh, involving myself, uh, John Straub, who you all know well, uh, Terry Boak from architecture, uh, Rania Al Hamoud is uh, a lecturer and expert in uh, sort of uh, engineering pedagogy and civil engineering, and uh, David Korea also in architecture. Uh, you can see we have a diverse background and expertise uh, related to structures, uh, architecture, and uh, building science. Um, 
I guess my title of director, I've been told, means that if anything goes wrong with the program, it's my fault. So uh, that, uh, that's, that's my role. Uh, and others are involved in uh, teaching uh, uh, courses that the students are currently taking, A100, 101, and 104. Um, as you can imagine, if you start up a new program uh, with 90 or so students, uh, you need uh, more people to deliver it. So we've uh, started growing our team. Uh, we've got uh, our first technician now, Dan Jessel. Uh, we've got some young faculty who have joined our group, Jonathan Enns, who you just met, uh, Daniel LaCroix and Eugene Kim. Uh, we also have our administrative coordinator, uh, Ellie Clark, uh, who, who's involved in a lot of different things uh, to get the program going. Um, this is just the start. Uh, once uh, we have uh, all five years of students on campus, we'll, we figure we'll need about 13 new faculty members and uh, two, two technicians and two admin uh, people. So, so there's going to be more people hired uh, in the coming years to, to uh, do all of the jobs required uh, to get the program going. So what is the program exactly? Uh, when we uh, designed it, our goal was to create a CAB accredited engineering program with a focus on buildings and building systems. Um, why did we bother doing this? Well, we, we think it'll support a massive industry, and here I'm probably preaching to the converted, but um, the construction of buildings and infrastructure in Canada employs about 1.2 million people, consumes 40% of, of our energy and 50% of our primary resources every year. So uh, construction is kind of a big deal. Uh, and as we heard earlier this morning, we spend very little on research and construction right now, and, and, uh, and, and, and so, uh, there's also an issue there. Um, we think the, the program will address a pressing societal need. Uh, we've talked a lot about low carbon building design. Uh, we know that about 30% of our greenhouse gas em emissions every year can be attributed to buildings. And so uh, clearly, if we can make better buildings, we can make a big dent on, on those emissions. Um, and uh, we also realized uh, as we went to university fair and other events to recruit students every year uh, that they were basically asking for us to create this program. Uh, every year we had students coming to us saying, you know, I can't decide if I want to go into architecture or civil engineering. Um, you know, I like uh, technical stuff and calculations, and, uh, and, but I also have creative interests. And, and so uh, part of the reason the program evolved was to basically create, create something for those students that, that want to sort of uh, pr pursue their creative interests as well as their technical interests and abilities. Uh, we also, uh, from talking to you, the employers uh, realized that there was a need for uh, uh, young engineers with knowledge in building design. Often uh, you're hiring civil engineers or mechanical or, or architects or uh, environmental scientists and kind of training them uh, on the job to do building science and building design. And so uh, we're, we're hoping with this program we can do more of it up front. Uh, the program, uh, once it's uh, reached steady state, will bring in 85 new students a year. Uh, we shot, overshot that target a little bit this year. We have 91 students, um, uh, which is great. Uh, but. Um, um, and uh, basically the uh, pedagogical approach we're employing uh, is, is uh, placing a heavy emphasis on peer learning. Uh, communication, collaboration, and design is kind of our mantra. And so I'll talk a little bit about what those things are about. Uh, we have a heavy emphasis on studio. Um, if you went through an engineering program, you might not know what studio is, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about that. And basically, uh, uh, we're, we're taking a good idea from our, our School of Architecture with, with the studio and offering a studio course every year that brings in projects and, and, and integrates ideas from across the other courses. Uh, our students will also take their entire third year, so 3A and 3B academic terms, uh, down in the School of Cambridge, where the, uh, School of Architecture in Cambridge, where, where they will work uh, with architectural students, learning how to communicate with them, and uh, work on, on collaborative projects uh, 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 together. So our first class is here. Uh, they're physically here, I can see. Uh, um, and, and so uh, please uh, try to talk to them if you get the chance. Uh, I understand a good number of them are looking for co-op jobs, so they might, uh, some of them might even have resumes in their back pockets ready to give you, but uh, um, uh, they're a great, uh, energetic bunch, and uh, I think you'll enjoy meeting them. So uh, this is a, uh, uh, basically a diagram trying to explain how architectural engineering uh, fits into our other engineering programs in uh, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, uh, and basically you can see that here there is a lot of overlap. Um, uh, 
designing buildings is a multidisciplinary uh, pursuit in its nature, so that's not entirely surprising. Uh, but uh, basically, this shows where the architectural engineer fits. Uh, they're going to have uh, focused expertise on building science and systems. Uh, they're they're going to be familiar with the more technological aspects of architectural design. Um, and they're also going to have knowledge about architectural project management. Uh, basically, our idea is that these uh, uh, young people will have uh, basically the ability to speak the language of, uh, languages of the different experts who are normally involved in building design, uh, help them communicate with each other, and communicate more effectively to make better buildings. Uh, this uh, chart shows uh, what the program looks like uh, over the, f the five years. It's a bit confusing. We, we have a four-year program spread over five years because of our, our compulsory co-op. Um, and so the students alternate uh, studying and working uh, uh, term, four-month terms over a five-year period. Um, in each of the terms, you can see the blue uh, courses at the top are the studio course they'll take, which uh, involves working on building design projects that integrate knowledge from their previous courses uh, and current courses. Um, and so this is where a lot of the new stuff uh, involved with ARCHE is going to happen. Uh, they, they have other courses each term which are sort of focused on RQE, like their, their History of Buildings course uh, 101 that they're taking right now. Um, a lot of the rest of the program, so, so the yellow, uh, uh, oh, it's yellow on my screen, uh, it's kind of purple. Uh, the, the courses in the bottom left are kind of the, uh, the bread and butter uh, uh, the, that a lot of our engineering students get regardless of their program. Um, we kept a lot of the solid mechanics and structures courses that our civil engineers get. Uh, we replaced a lot of their other courses with, uh, uh, to make room for studio. And then in fourth year, we've developed a bunch of new uh, uh, technical electives which, uh, um, which focus on uh, building science and architectural engineering. So that's basically uh, what the program looks like in a nutshell. And like I said, the whole 3A and 3B, uh, they're studying in Cambridge. Uh, here's an example of some of the new courses we're developing uh, tailored to, to RQE, which will address some of the issues we've been talking about today. Uh, history of the built environment, uh, architectural graphics and communication, environmental building studio, uh, engin architectural engineering studio, as well as upper year electives in building enclosure, building structures, building performance, et cetera. Um, so we're uh, placing a greater emphasis on experiential learning in this program, and I would say that that's uh, something that all of our engineering programs are trying to do. Uh, but I would say it's in the very DNA of architectural engineering uh, th that uh, we're going to do a lot of more hands-on stuff uh, and, and uh, give uh, our students uh, a better appreciation for uh, what the formulas they're using actually mean and, and uh, what they can do with them. Um, Experiential learning is something, like I say, we're trying to bring in across our programs. One of the ways we do that is with student teams, uh, design teams. Uh, this is one I'm involved with in uh, the Steel Bridge team, uh, where they learn how to do their own welding. Uh, uh, they learn practical things like the, uh, um, the bolt hole has to be bigger than the bolt. Uh, and uh, uh, they learn things like teamwork and communication, uh, things that we can try to teach in the classroom, but that, uh, they generally learn better uh, by doing. Uh, we've already got other student teams on campus that are more uh, doing more work that's more closely related to, to uh, uh, building science and, and buildings already. Um, we've got a very active Habitat for Humanity uh, student team. Uh, they're also involved in, they have a component called Warrior Home, which, which uh, uh, d does uh, design competitions and actually won uh, uh, their category in a big American uh, uh, international competition last year uh, for uh, attached house uh, design. Uh, so already students uh, in our other programs here doing great things related to buildings. Our, our key students are obviously going to want to get involved in this stuff as they go along. Uh, so what's studio all about? Uh, well, uh, in architecture programs, uh, students uh, have a thing called studio where they have their own desk. Uh, they sit and work on projects and build models uh, and a lot of good and talk to professors in a more informal environment. A lot of good things happen from that. Uh, there's uh, group interaction and peer learning. Uh, normally, we tell our engineering students not to, to look at their neighbor's work. Uh, in, in design studio, we want them to, and we want them to see that, hey, their neighbor is doing a better job than they are, so maybe they should uh, uh, kick things up a notch and make their own uh, design a little better. And, and so th there's this peer learning that happens that, that can only happen in studio. Um, 
Uh, basically, they get ideas from their surroundings. Uh, we're building a maker's space where they can do rapid prototyping, uh, and, and uh, lots of good things happen from studio that we're trying to bring into our engineering uh, pro program, uh, I think, in an original way. Um, so this uh, shows the original concept for our studio. We're, we're actually building two studios on our Waterloo campus right now. Uh, the, the concept came actually from architecture students uh, who, de who developed it as a design project. Uh, basically, uh, the uh, space, I would say, is a premium uh, on our main campus like it is on any university campus. So we needed to find an intelligent way to take our, our space that we were given and, and, uh, you, and do everything it needed to do. So uh, studios are, are, as you can see here, are a place where students sit and work on projects. They build models. Uh, they do a thing called critiques where they stand around and look at each other's models and, uh, and talk about what's wrong with them. Uh, and uh, and uh, they, they need their desks where they work in the project. So the idea was to take the, long, uh, the spaces that we got, uh, we, roughly two thirds of it is, is desks uh, where they work on projects. The other third is, is an area which is basically a lecture area which can uh, be quickly transformed into an, uh, an area for group work uh, or uh, uh, critique boxes where, where they can do their critiques. Uh, and, and so basically we're building two spaces right now that, that are gonna serve all these functions. Um, the first one is on the first floor of our CPH building. Uh, we're calling it Studio One. Um, probably can imagine the branding opportunity here. Uh, if, if you want a studio named after your company, let me know. Um, uh, right next to it is our, uh, our maker space uh, where the students will have access to uh, laser scanner, laser, laser cutters, sorry, uh, uh, 3D printers and uh, uh, tools for building models. Um, the second studio will be on the third floor of CPH um, uh, and uh, uh, both studios have a lot of access to light. Uh, there'll be big open spaces where we, if it's anything like our School of Architecture, we expect the students to, to, to basically live uh, there and work on their projects and interact all term. I've been to the one in, Cam in Cambridge. Uh, lots of nice building models, but also jars of peanut butter on, on the, the shelves and things like that, which suggests to me that they really literally do live there. Um, so uh, our first studio is uh, very close to completion. Uh, this is a picture from a week or so ago. Um, we would have liked it to have been opened uh, on September 1st, but uh, uh, the construction ran into some challenges with uh, asbestos and underground pipes, and, and it's taken a little longer than we expected. But it's very close. Our current students are going to get into it this term, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, it's going to, uh, I, I think, coming along very nicely and going to be an excellent space when it's done. Uh, so that's kind of the story of how we got where we are now. I'm going to hand things over to John for a couple slides to talk about uh, what our students have been up to for the last few months. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, so as he mentioned early on, uh, design, collaboration, uh, communications are the core of our ArcEdge program. Um, and part of the challenge has been to say, well, we still want like what we consider good engineers that have the good math, calculus, physics, chemistry, material science skills. But we also want them to learn how to collaborate, learn how to communicate, and understand design in a in a um, in a, in a bit more a proper sense, a more open-sided sense, a more innovative sense. And so we thought we'd start off with the bang, uh, which means the first uh, two days of classes were cancelled, and instead what we had was a what we called the architectural engineering design days. And they, what, what this involved was a small design project that required them to conceive a design, uh, come up with a drawing set of materials. They actually had a budget for how much money they could spend. They needed to build it. It was then tested after they presented their ideas uh, to an assembled group of luminaries. Okay, people who would show up. Um, and so that was sort of in a, in a two-day process, we tried to combine what a real design process would be like uh, and the design uh, pro uh, problem that they were given was they were given various sites around the university that they needed to design furniture for uh, to do various things. And so the students would, were given a site and chose what to make out of it. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see cardboard was one of the materials that they were allowed to use. They had glue guns, tape, and they also could pour uh, a form of modeling plaster, which was kind of like uh, concrete that happens really quickly. 
Um, so we started, of course, the students got together in groups because nobody builds a building on their own. Uh, we're always, that's the collaboration part. Uh, then they had to uh, come up with sketched ideas to say how are we going to solve the problem. Uh, during the, uh, the sketching process, uh, people walked around uh, and provided advice and sounding boards, uh, so, uh, but the students had an option to ignore the advice, uh, kind of like real life. Uh, and uh, then, but they got other people's inputs to come up with uh, an idea, and they were required to be able to articulate that idea in drawings uh, and sketches. Um, then they began the construction process where you get good feedback on what kind of material properties are like, what they can do, uh, and already a lot of the commentary came back from students was that, well, if we did this again, we would probably do it differently because we learned more about how precisely we could cut things, how strong the wood or the uh, cardboard or the concrete actually was, and that that's, again, like real life. It's that feedback loop of when you do it, but you've got to pay attention to feed it back into the next loop when you do it again. Um, here's an example of uh, furniture being used to be uh, uh, sat upon uh, with the proud developers. Um, of course, some of them used more tape and, uh, than others. Uh, there's a long tradition of duct tape in the uh, modeling world anyway. Uh, but we had presentations, you can see in the upper right. Uh, so without any education slash training by the University of Waterloo, students were making oral presentations in pretty good quality PowerPoint, frankly, uh, that would have been uh, stood up well in a fourth year class on saying, this is our process, these are the problems, this is how we chose to make the design. And then we use the low-tech approach of testing to destruction. So civil engineers have a problem in that that's how they test most things. It's like just keep loading it until it breaks. And so we thought we'd try that. Um, it was, it's more definitive than a beauty contest, uh, but uh, that's why we ended up using this. Um, and so that was the end, and, and really, did we have a winner? Well, we, we had kind of winners. It was a, it was a, a, a popular choice award where uh, everyone decided which one they thought was the best as a combination. But, you know, really the purpose here is not to have a winner, it's to, to, to experience design, think about it in a different way, and start working in groups and learning that it doesn't matter if you've got the best idea, if you can't communicate it, it's not the best idea. Uh, and so those things were all wrapped into a two-day intensive program, uh, which I think was reasonably fun. Uh, nobody dropped out although they are kind of hovering menacingly above us right now, uh, if you look around you, yes. Um, so another aspect of the AE program is that because it's about buildings and focuses on buildings, we have the advantage that there's a lot of buildings around us. Um, and because we're keen on, like if you're, if you're teaching how to design gas turbines, it's pretty tough to get into the gas turbine without a lot of effort. If you're designing like chips or software, you, cannot, you can't even see what makes it work. One of the big advantages of buildings is that we can actually see them and, and live in them and touch them and know how they, they work. And so we took advantage of that possibility and we'll be doing that throughout the program of trying to connect to reality. Some of the discussions on panels today are some of the non-tangible realities of regulation and economics, but the tangible realities we can go, for, go about and walk around. And so we've tried this for the first time this year. Uh, I walked around with a pointer uh, to point at what's flashing weep holes. Why is that cracked? Why did that color fade? Uh, why does it look like that's leaking? Is it because it's leaking? Um, and some of the realities of the building industry and also building technologies so that people look at a building and know the difference between a synthetic stucco building and a concrete building, what those stains are, does it mean that those cracks in that concrete mean the building's about to fall down or just in need of maintenance? Um, and also the, the ugly back ends of buildings in the upper left hand side. Um, what makes most of our buildings work is that actually a pretty complicated connection to infrastructure, whether that's the garbage truck going in and out, or the gas line, or the power lines, and the communication lines. And so we tried to uh, bring some of those things in which are very visible to the informed observer. 
Uh, and so the intention here was to get students to start being informed observers so that they will learn and understand, look at holes in walls when they walk by, so that learning isn't something you just do in the classroom, uh, just wandering around on a Friday night downtown Waterloo. There's lots you can learn about buildings and building performance, and that's much more effective than me giving boring slide presentations. So uh, our projects, the purpose of Design Studio is to uh, give people practice on doing design collaboration and communication. Um, and they will have to be doing this all the way through their every term for eight terms. Um, so we started uh, smaller. Uh, we chose a client that one can't make too many assumptions about, and that was a, chick a backyard chicken coop that meets the city of Kitchener's uh, building permit requirements for, for chicken coops. And of course, this starts with the problem definition. I was quite interested to hear Craig say that, you know, we need to actually define what success looks like or define what problem we're trying to solve. And so that's basically what we're talking about in the design process and how we teach it, is you start with identify the problem that you're trying to solve. Don't just start jumping on cool stuff and call it innovation. So the chicken coop was the first project, uh, and uh, as is a tradition in, in most of the design arts, industrial design, architecture, et cetera, um, students are posting the drawings of their uh, solutions on walls for groups of others to look at, comment on, and, and all of us to learn from. Because pretty, we just did this uh, for the chicken coop and it's sort of like pretty much every project had something that was good and something that was bad and when we start looking at uh, a dozen or so projects you start saying wow you could get a lot of good out of those dozens and when next time we can avoid a lot of the not so good about them. and that's the process so chicken coop very fast and dirty project uh, literally sometimes dirty uh, and the next project is a, a bunky, so we're taking it up a scale so that it is for human occupation now. Uh, it's, you're going to, but it is simply a building for sleeping uh, on the Trans-Canada Trail, which happens to go through uh, the Environmental Reserve and the North Campus uh, here at the University of Waterloo. Uh, and so that's going to be their next project that they will complete by the end of this month. Now, I can, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit here about the Low Carbon Buildings Project, and this is uh, not of course, not just AE. The architectural engineering students will, of course, be very focused on low carbon buildings, uh, but civil engineers, environmental engineers, uh, ha and mechanical engineers all have an important role that they're going to be playing in the future of low carbon buildings. And so we've received some funding from the, uh, the, the provincial government to develop tools, techniques, uh, educational support for low carbon buildings. Um, and just, you know, as an example, on the upper right-hand side, uh, the color photograph, it's an infrared uh, photograph. We've purchased a number of infrared cameras for students to use in building reviews so that they can start seeing where things get hot, things get cold. The box that we're seeing there is a, essentially a building uh, that is a scale model of an insulated building. And the heater is a light bulb, uh, which is a well-known heat producer. Uh, and we can do things like change the amount of insulation in the walls, change the amount of glazing. We can even put it outside and turn it into an easy-bake oven to understand the uh, challenges of all glazing facing the wrong way on buildings in Canada. Um, so various measurements are going to be uh, developed. So these are hands-on labs again. Students will touch insulation, understand heated spaces, where the heat goes out, at this scale and be able to use uh, measurement technologies like infrared cameras to then go out and look at real buildings to understand uh, what's going on and what they're seeing. So uh, final slide here for where are we going next? Well, onward and upward, obviously. Uh, so we're going to uh, finish our, our first studio, uh, see how we can make it better uh, and, and improve upon it. We need uh, more faculty members, and interestingly enough, part of the consequence of the construction business not investing in R&D very much, uh, or at what they I think they call, uh, the economist calls it at pathetic, quote unquote, levels, um, we, actually there's not a lot of funded research to produce PhDs. That's the traditional academic process. And so the academic uh, world does not produce a lot of faculty members who actually are suited to 
the real world of providing, building information for mechanical systems, uh, uh, heating and cooling, insulation, water management, construction, etc. So it is actually a challenge for us, and we've been blessed, I think, that we're getting a lot of applicants of people who are skirting around the edge because there's a lot of people who are interested in this. But it is a, a challenge going forward. And hopefully we can eventually mean that we can start producing those um, faculty members for other universities when they eventually get around to doing programs like this. Um, and of course, we're going to hopefully be able to collaborate more with industry partners, municipal levels of government, provincial and federal, uh, on serving the need that we have for not just innovation for low energy buildings, but just innovation in buildings that are more comfortable, don't smell bad, don't leak, are easier to build, uh, and can respond to the needs of materials, labor, and land that we have available. So thanks for your attention. Uh, that's a, basically just a pure informational presentation about AE. I think it would be worthwhile uh, over lunch, we have 15 minutes till lunch or so, uh, to be able to talk to some of the students uh, and uh, get to know uh, what kind of people are interested in our building industry, uh, in our world, uh, that, that many of you are involved in and that they are going to want to enter.